All right, you have your Bibles. Turn to the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth. And uh, we're going to start tonight in the book of Ruth for a few moments. The Lord being our helper. And uh, I would like to say that uh, I'm, not gonna, I'm, not try, I'm not going to try to hurry through this book. But at the same time, I'm not going to try to take and uh, uh, skip, skip through this book. I'd like to take and point out a few things as we go through it, and I'd like for it to be a blessing, and I'd like for it to take and be practical. Now, I think this, this book, is every time I go through it, it, something new comes into my heart and my mind, and uh, uh, I pray that you'll take and read the book, and you'll meditate upon it, and that God will give you things out of this wonderful little book. Now, I confess that There'll be a lot of uh, a lot of stuff that, uh, as we go through the book, you'll say, "Where in the world did you get that, brother Rap?" And I'm I'm on your side. I ain't got no idea where I got it, but uh, if it helps us, it'll help us, you know. So I want to just take a few things and and talk about them, make a few suggestions, and like I said, I'm, I'm in describing what we're going to do, we're going to just get in it and waller around and see if we can't unfold some truth in it, and see if it'll help us, all right? I want to go to chapter number one tonight, and uh, I'm going to deal with just the first few verses, and uh, it's going to seem as if we're going to pay, pay uh, a little extra time in chapter number one, but uh, that's because we hadn't gotten to chapter two yet, or chapter three, so let's just get started and see how it comes out, all right? Notice, if you will, in Ruth chapter number one, Verse number one, now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judea, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, the name of his wife Naomi, the name of his two sons Malon and Chilion. Ephratites of Bethlehem, Judea. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. She was left and her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab, and the name of the one was Orphan, the name of the other Ruth. And they dwelt there about ten years. And Malon and Chilion died also, both of them. And the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. I'm going to stop reading there, and that's perhaps all that we would even hope to say anything about tonight. But I'm going to stop reading there for the sake of time and try to say a few things about these verses in just a moment. Uh, let me give you another thought or two when you consider the book of Ruth, you know, just by way of introduction. Especially in this chapter number one. Uh, it's the worst of times as far as Israel as a nation is concerned. But God is still sovereignly working out His will behind the saints. Sin is still being restrained in such a tremendous way by the hand of the Lord. And Satan is still limited in what he can do in this world. And we need to be reminded of that sometimes. The devil may look like he's having a heyday, but he still gets his orders from the Lord. God only lets him do so much, and uh, that's all he can do. God's on the march in this little book of Ruth. He's behind the scenes working out his sovereign will. And so it is in our day. It may not see, we may not feel like we can see the Lord moving here and there, but I promise you He's behind the scenes working out His will. In Judges chapter 19, there in verse number 25, In those days there was no king in Israel, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. But immediately upon the end of that verse, you can read verse 1 of Ruth and it says, Now... And uh, hallelujah to God for that. 
Every man can do what he wants to do and every man can take and be his own king. But for the child of God, there's an ever present now and God is in the now. God's providentially preparing through the book of Ruth, providentially preparing for Israel's greatest king to come. See, David is going to be born through the, through the lineage and line of little sister Ruth. And he's pointing to the greater king, our Lord Jesus. And so, even in the midst of the darkness, God is laying the groundwork and providentially working out so that men can see he's still in charge and preparing for our blessed Lord Jesus to come through this little book. Now God works his will in the midst of seemingly frustrated situations. That's what we're opening up with in this book. A very, very tragic, frustrating type of a situation. And often he works them through the most adversities of human uh, situations. Uh, most, so many times it's adversity and human events that, that really puts the spotlight upon what God's doing. And the book of Ruth is like that. It turns the spotlight, if you please, upon the Lord. Now I want to say this, and I hope I, I hope I can show it to you as we go through the book. Sometimes God seems to hide himself from his people. There are times when it seems that the Lord leaves his people to themselves. And uh, if you've never had that experience or you've never seen that, dear friend, I want to say, well, hang on, it's coming after a while. You're going to look for him to the left and you're not going to see him. And to the right, you're not going to see him. He's not going to be behind you. He's not going to be in front of you. And sometimes it seems like that. But I want to tell you this. God is still ordering the events for his glory and for your good. There are two verses that come to mind in the light of that. Amos chapter number 3 and verse 6 says, Shall there be evil in a city and the Lord hath not done it. That is, shall evil come down or judgment come down or punishment come down on a city and God hadn't done it? Certainly God punished Sodom and Gomorrah and those five cities of the plains in Genesis. And then over and over you'll go, you'll go through the scriptures and you'll see where God brought judgment down upon a city. Uh, Nineveh, uh, Babylon, right on down. God brought judgment upon a city and even on a country. And Amos says, uh, shall evil come into a city and the Lord hath not done it. Uh, evil will come at times, but it's the Lord who did it. And then I'll tell you something else. We ought to be able to say, this is the Lord's doing and it's marvelous in our eyes. And so here's, here's Israel going astray from God and God's bringing punishment upon them and yet at the same time God is bringing little sister Ruth along and what, is, what has been done by the Lord, we look and we're puzzled at it but at the same time we marvel at it because it's marvelous in our eyes to see what God has done. Now, having said that, there's only uh, maybe a, uh, well, it's not many folks that will take the attitude of old brother Job in the midst of their adversity. Listen to what Job's attitude is in the midst of his adversity. In chapter number 12 and verse 9, Who knoweth not in all these that the hand of the Lord hath wrought this? in whose hand is the soul of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. God is still in control regardless of what's transpiring. And we'll see that in the book of Ruth. Now, for those of you that like to take notes and keep up with things in your scriptures, there are four doctrinal or theological truths 
that I want to take and draw from and illustrate and demonstrate in these short chapters. The first one in chapter number one, I'd like to show you how faith works. How faith works. And I promise you that faith works in some tremendous ways we've never even thought about before. Faith will work. It works to bring, uh, well, it works its way in, and then it works its way out, and then it'll work its way through. And you'll see that as we go through chapter number one. Chapter number two, we're going to see how providence works. The great mystery of providence. God before the scenes, God behind the scenes, God between the scenes, God beyond the scenes. We'll see how that works. Chapter number three, we're going to see how hope works. You realize that God has deposited something in you that makes you hope for eternal things? You will not be left hopeless in this world. Boy, thank God for that because when you begin to look at society around us, so many folks seem to be in despair and hopeless. But we have a hope, hallelujah. And so we see in chapter number three how hope works. Chapter number four, we're going to see how redemption works. How redemption works. We sang the song tonight about down at the cross. And uh, hallelujah for the cross. And I bless the Lord for that. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord. Thank God for that. And then sister sang uh, that song, There is a Fountain. All of those hook us up in our mind to God's redeeming love and redeeming grace. But I want to say to you, there's more to it than just the idea of redemption. Redemption becomes a fact. And uh, I want to say a word about that uh, as we go through chapter number four. Now back to chapter number one. In chapter number one, there are two movements, human movements, that you're going to notice in the chapter. In chapter number one, there's that move from Bethlehem to Moab. And of course, Elimelech takes his family down to Moab. The Bible said they went to sojourn in verse number one to the country of Moab. Down there in verse number two, it said they continued. They were there in Moab and continued there. Then, of course, Elimelech died in Moab. And so there's the human movements from Bethlehem to Moab and then from Moab, the latter part of the chapter, back to Bethlehem. Now, those are human movements. But behind those human movements, there are multiple divine movements. You may think that you are ordering your steps by your own uh, personal ambition and will and uh, stepping in the direction you want to. But I want to tell you, behind the steps of what we call human movements, there's divine movements. God sent the famine and God sends death and God, uh, you see, God in the choosing of these wives, you see, widowhood, all of those things we can't do anything about. But God's behind the scenes doing something about all those things. By the way, that word that came from Bethlehem, that there was bread in, in Bethlehem, who, who sent that word? We hadn't got no aunt, nobody told us his name. How'd they find that out? That's not common news around uh, Moab, and yet God sent it right down there. Somehow it got to them. Oh, I want to tell you, God knows how to get his message across, get it to where it needs to be. And so we'll see those types of things. That journey back from Moab to Bethlehem, uh, maybe a hundred miles 
It's through desperate country and terrain. Multiple uh, thieves and robbers and, and hostile elements. Who's going to take care of these two little widows? Who's going to provide for them? Who's going to protect them? <laughs> oh, listen, when our steps are uncertain, dear friend, thank God, there's somebody that's a taking care of us. I bless him for it. Now, having said that, in chapter number one, I'd like for you to consider how faith works. How faith works. Now, faith does work. It really does. And I think you're going to be able to see how faith comes alive in little sister Ruth's life. And then I'm sure you're going to be able to see that faith had been alive in Elimelech and Naomi's lives also. In fact, Elimelech's name means God is my king. When he was a little boy, his mom and daddy got he brought him uh, back to the tent and they named him Elimelech because their family served and worshiped God. And he grew up in that. And so uh, there's no reason for us to doubt that he was not a staunch uh, believer and that he was, he was rigid in the ways of Israel, the covenant people of God. Until the time that he went to leave, we do not have any suggestion that he walked anywhere but in the will of God, living on the home place, their inheritance, and evidently a man of some kind of wealth because Naomi's testimony was that they went out full. And uh, we know he had a, had a kinsman, Boaz, that was a, a, a good man and a God-fearing man. And so we, we can see these types of things in them. And so we know he must have been a man somewhat acquainted with faith. And Naomi likewise. Faith works. Now saving faith and serving faith are fruit from the same tree. They're fruit from the same tree. If you have saving faith, you are going to have an element of serving faith in your life. Now believing and working go together. The Bible says of Abraham in Romans chapter number four that Abraham was justified by faith. That means faith. He believed God and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. Hallelujah. That's how you got in. How I got in. But then over in the book of James it says that uh, Abraham was justified by works. Now here's the difference. Whenever Paul uses Abraham as an illustration, he speaks of his faith stepping out and resting upon the promises of God, believing faith, saving faith. When James speaks about it, he speaks about it over there in Genesis 22, where at the end of a number of years, having walked with God, believed God, counted on the promises of God, being picked up by God, he offers up Isaac and it demonstrated to all the world that he believed God and he justified him that God was accounted able to raise him up is what faith said in the life of Abraham. And so, Faith both saves and faith also that saves works. Now, in chapter number one, I'm going to give you the chapter outline in case I don't give back to you, get back to it, you know, and I'm not going to try to deal with all of it tonight, just a, just a couple of verses here. But chapter number one, you're going to see in those first five verses the collapse of faith. The collapse of faith. And we're going to discover that one of the reasons faith collapses is because of fear. Fear. Elimelech 
got fearful about the bread shortage in Bethlehem. Then in verse number, down verse number four, five, six, and seven, you, we're going to see the connection of faith. Here little sister Ruth is going to kind of come on the scene. Now let me say, say to you, faith is what connects us to God. Yeah. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. You can't believe God without faith. God works faith in you, and then your faith works its way unto the Lord. Well, I'll say to you, uh, we got to have a connection. Well, how does little sister Ruth come in contact with real Bible faith in God? She's got a connection. Then also, uh, you'll notice in verse number 8 and following, the cleaving of faith. That is, faith cleaves, cleaves to its object. Now, I, I say this reverently, but I, but I, I'm, I say it and we'll talk about it later. Not tonight, but later. Uh, uh, when, when real faith transpires in a person's life, they want to hold on to God with everything they got. They don't even want to entertain life without Him. How tedious and tasteless the hours when the Lord is not nigh. And so I want to say, faith will cleave to the Lord. Uh, and there are several reasons for that. And we'll, we'll talk about that again at, at another time. But then the, the fourth thing I want to say is, there is a commitment of faith. And of course, you notice the commitment, verse 16 and 17, a commitment of life that stretches all the way through this life, even under the grave and beyond it. Treat me not to leave thee, nor from following after thee, little sister Ruth said. And of course, the continuation or the compensation of faith when they get back to Bethlehem. Hallelujah to God. Faith, here's what faith will do. You can trace it anywhere you want to in the life of the people of God. Faith will bring you out it brought Abraham out of the area of the Chaldees. Faith will carry you on. Faith will take you in. And faith will, if you get away, bring you back. And so the, we're going we're gonna to trace some of these ideas about faith. Now the collapse of faith. There in those first five verses. The... Uh, uh, maybe I'd like to preface what I want to say about that by saying this. Faith is seldom, if ever, seldom, if ever, produced under favorable circumstances. Seldom, if ever, produced under favorable circumstances. Real faith is born in the chambers of need. And uh, we go through adversity, poverty, and want. Desperation, if you please, to come to faith. We are driven to faith. And when we once receive faith, and faith is placed in the Lord, that faith is developed in us. God develops it. Now, I... I think some folks have been sadly double exposed, if you please. Uh, but faith is developed. Uh, if you've been saved any time at all, and you've been reading your Bible, been faithful to the house of God, God's putting things in you that was not in you before. Isn't that true? So it's being developed. Now, notice several things in chapter number one or in, under this idea of the collapse of faith. I'd like for you to notice, first of all, that there is a dilemma that we faced in chapter number one, verse number one. Elimelech and his family are experiencing a famine. And it seems like when these first five verses you read them, everything in their life is falling apart. I mean, it just, just looks like it's disaster everywhere they turn. 
There's the trial of the famine. There's the family of, uh, of Elimelech and Naomi uh, relocating. They make several very bad decisions as a couple. And they are paying the consequences and prices for of it. The first bad decision that they make. Now this in my own mind is this. The first bad decision that they make is that they try to run from their adversity. Their affliction. Their problems. You can't run from your problems. They're going to run from the famine in the land. And the problem with folks nowadays is that, that it's easier to run away than it is to stay there and face the difficulty. And so Elimelech, it's nothing new. They decide to run and go down to Moab. Now, I put a little star beside this note in my mind and in my Bible. This is what I call the test of a, of, a, of a providence. The test of providence and the temperament to pursue or to persevere are two key elements in knowing and living a life of faith. Providence is going to test you and, and a a temperament with the persuasion to stay true to God is going to be the key element in your living a life that is true to the Lord. And so we've got to face our, our problems. Now there are three ways to deal with or respond to problems. There are more of them, but I'm only going to give you three of them. Now, you can respond to your problems, your difficulties, your adversity in one of these three ways. One, you can just square up, buckle back your shoulders, and take a hold and endure your problem, your tribulation. By sheer determination, you can make up your mind that you're going to deal with that thing yourself. I'm going to tell you, that might sound good, and that might be the best that a lost person can do, but it's absolutely the worst thing a saved person can do. If you try to endure your situation and deal with it yourself, eventually it's going to master you. It sure is. It'll make you at some point become so frustrated, so discouraged, so bitter, distress will set in. Hard heartedness will take over if you try to deal with your problem yourself. You can't do it. You weren't designed as a child of God to do it. And so we don't have to endure our problems by ourselves. There's another thing you can do, and that's what Elimelech and them chose to do. They chose to escape it. Try to escape it. Run away from it. Now if you go to running from your problems, your difficulties... What's going to happen is you're going to miss God's purpose, what he's trying to do in your life. You're going to run away from what God is trying to teach you in your life. And uh, God is trying to accomplish something in you. You know, some of you have the idea, uh, like I did, when, when, you got, when I got saved, I didn't, I, I didn't think I was ever going to sin again. I mean, I got so clean in my heart. I walked that high for I don't know how long. I, I didn't even think my feet were going to touch the ground, you know. Of course, it wasn't long before I realized I was still made of earthly stuff. And how disappointed I was, you know. But uh, you can run from your problems. And if you run from them, you're not going to allow God to accomplish what he wants to accomplish. You see, God wants to do something in your life. 
One, he may want to increase your faith. Listen to what Peter said. That the trial of your faith being much more precious than gold that perisheth. God's trying to put something in you. Or he may be trying to increase your forbearance. He says, knowing this, James says, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. You reckon God's trying to put some patience in us? <laughs> he sends those difficult times to send patience in our I don't know what I'm going to, you know. I'll say something about that in a minute if we get that far. <laughs> Maybe God's trying to increase your fullness, your, your uh, maturity. Here's what Job says. says, But he knoweth the way that I take, and when he hath tried me, I shall come forth. Maybe God's trying to really mature you up through the difficulties that you're having. Or maybe your future ministry. God has something for you out yonder to do. He says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 4, Who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are troubled by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. God may, God may be qualifying you to minister to somebody else through what you're suffering. You know. Or maybe he's trying to just get a hold of your heart and increase your faithfulness. There's no chastening that seems to be pleasant, joyous, comfortable at the beginning. You know. But the Bible said afterwards it yieldeth the peaceable fruits of righteousness. Might be God just trying to get us faithful. Or maybe God is trying to build in us a, an ability to focus. To keep our mind and eye on him. You do remember that the apostle Paul said... When we come to the table of the Lord, that we to, are to examine ourselves to see if we be of the faith. You know, focus, single mind, single eyed upon the Lord. We need to focus on ourselves as far as our heart being clean. We need to focus on our relationship with others. That's why we bring our gift to the altar and we leave it there and then we go to our brother and we got some kind of alt or they have an alt against us. That's why, that, that's why we are, we're focusing upon what the Lord would want to do in our lives. Or maybe God wants to instigate a fix in your life and my life. You do know God uses trials to bring us back to himself. He wants to restore us if we're away from him. And sometimes the only way he can deal with us is through a trial and a difficulty. Turn our minds upon the Lord. Here's what David said. David said, before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I have kept thy word. God sends things of that nature. So you can escape them if you want to, but you ain't really going to escape them. Because you're going to meet them right down the road somewhere. Or you can uh, take and try to endure them, but you ain't going to really endure them. You're just going to get yourself in a, a terrible fix trying to. I'm going to stout myself up and harden myself and nobody's going to hurt me again. Well, help yourself. It ain't going to work. Or, number three, you can enlist them. And I mean by that, you can overcome them. You can make them your servants. You don't have to fight against them. You don't have to get flustered about them. You can make them to work for you. You can use them to draw you nearer to him. You can use them to make you more understanding of them. 
You can take and use them as the truth of Romans 8, 28 says that God shall supply, that God's able uh, 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 to work all things out for, for, for your good to them that love God. Romans 8, 28 is still in the Bible. And so we can enlist them. Now Naomi and Elimelech tried to flee the famine and uh, uh, it just didn't work. Now, that's a common attitude of all of us. Now I'm, I'm going to tell you something. I don't like to hurt. I mean I know that's a real revelation but I don't like to hurt. I don't even like to feel uncomfortable. Can I get any witness to that? You know. And so, so, so I, I'm, I'm trying to give Brother Elimelech as much slack as I can right here. You know, famine is not an easy situation. But you still can't run from the difficulties. Now God promised Israel famine. He promised it to them. I was reading over here in Deuteronomy 11. Let me read you a passage right here. And God just put it in black and white where there wouldn't be any doubt about it. Deuteronomy chapter number 11. Listen to verse number 16 right here. Deuteronomy 11, 16. Here's what he says. Take heed to yourselves that your heart be not deceived. And ye turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. And then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you. And he shut up the heaven that there be no rain. That the land yield not her fruit. And lest ye perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord God giveth you. Well that's exactly what was going on in the days of the judges. They became idol worshipers and they forgot the Lord and God sent a judgment upon them to bring them back to Him. And Elimelech and Naomi flee. God promised them a famine if that was to happen. Now there are several reasons people flee the famine. Time's run out. And I ain't run out. So I'm going to hook back up Sunday night and tell you several reasons why people flee the flat famine. And uh, if you find yourself in this thing, we want to get right with God. We don't want to just, you know, beat the air. We want to get right with the Lord. And I, I mean, we've done, we done been enough in this thing, long enough in this thing to realize this. We ain't playing games. You and I are going to die one of these days and we won't meet God with a good slate. Amen. Isn't that right? All right. I'll quit. But I just wanted to give you, I just wanted to start quenching, you know, getting your appetite. You got to sprinkle a little, somebody said you can lead a, lead a horse to water but you can't make him drink. But that's not true. If you'll take and put enough salt in his grain, He'll drink the water fountain dry. And so that's what I'm doing. I'm trying to salt her down and get us to whet our appetite, all right? All right, let's stand together.